is Steve Brennan, and I'm the Acting Director of External Affairs here at DSG. I think all of us here today are very well aware of the crucial role that GCC countries play in the global energy supply chain. And I think we're also pretty cognizant of the connections between energy supplies, geopolitics, economics, and increasingly with environmental concerns. Our discussion tonight is going to explore some of these connections in relation to what seems to be a complementary fit between Europe's energy needs and the abundant supplies of natural gas found in several GCC states. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to take a moment to thank the sponsor of tonight's event, the Kennedy Group. Their strong support for open, vibrant dialogue and quality research on relevant public policy issues is a model of corporate citizenship. And we're thankful for their generous support. Mr. Fahim Kano, Mr. Mahmoud Pian, welcome to you and to all of the Kano Group team that are here with us tonight. Our speaker tonight, Justin Dargan, is a prolific author on energy affairs. With over 50 book chapters and articles in such publications as the Middle East Economic Survey, the Oxford Ener Institute of Energy Studies, and the Oil and Gas Journal. He's the author of the forthcoming, group, uh, the forthcoming book, Desert Dreams, The Quest for Gulf Integration from the Arab Revolt to the Gulf Cooperation Council. And we have available outside a few papers that Justin has also published with DSG. Justin is a research fellow with the Dubai Initiative, the joint program that DSG has with the Harvard Kennedy School, and a Fulbright Scholar of the Middle East. He's worked in the International Legal Department of Owens Corning, in the, Interna in the Legal Department of OPEC, and as a researcher for the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies, where he pioneered the first major substantive work on the transnational gas trade in the form of the Dalton Project. His research specialties include carbon trading, the global oil and gas market, the legal framework surrounding the Gulf energy sector, and the geopolitics of the Middle East. Justin, the floor is yours. Uh, great. Well, thank you uh, very much, Steve, uh, for that. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Steve, uh, for that uh, very uh, excellent uh, introductory uh, uh, remark. Uh, so, as you are all aware, my name is Justin Dargan, and I'm a research fellow by the shift at Today I'm going to speak about uh, something which I guess has been a bit eclipsed uh, in the news lately due to the ongoing uh, transformation of the region. So I guess uh, some things have been left a bit in hindsight, but I'm going to speak about the more structural changes that have been occurring uh, in the region in terms of uh, nascent economic, uh, military, potential military relations, uh, energy and financial relations between the GCC and the uh, European Union. And I think that this will come to fruition over the next decade uh, as we start to see closer and closer links uh, being forged between these two uh, regional blocks. Uh, now, just to put in context, uh, both organizations, if you look at the GCC and the European Union, were born in an environment of fear. And what was that fear about? Well, the fear in the European Union uh, was that there would be another general European war. So the European Union was created out of the sense of urgency in order to Star or at least mitigate any potential or future possibility for European countries to come or to, to be at war with each other ever again. So that's the context, of the, the simplistically, of the birth of the EU. And if we look at the GCC, uh, it was born out of fear as well. Uh, the GCC was uh, created in 1981. And uh, if any of us either read about that period of time or if we were even alive during that time period or what have you, that was a very dangerous neighborhood. That time period. So if we look at uh, the late 70s, uh, there was a Marxist uh, quite uh, revolutionary regime in Ethiopia right across the Red Sea of uh, Gistu, in Gistu and Gistu and Of course, there were uh, relations between his regime with uh, Pidri, the People's, uh, People's Democratic Republic of Yemen, South Yemen, of course, which was another uh, revolutionary Marxist uh, regime. But then there was a the regime of uh, Said uh, Badi, as well as self styled Maoist. Somalia, and uh, basically uh, Said Buddy, uh, he moved to 1991. And then there was also the Iranian Revolution of the Islamic Revolution in 
Young. This was 1971. This was what people, I guess, they call today a huge game changer in the sense of security perceptions for the region. And then during that time, there was increasing instability uh, in the region. Also, there were high protests and what have you that were linked with um, alleged green interference in domestic affairs uh, of the Gulf, the Gulf region. And then to go a bit farther afield, we had the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, which I believe was 19. And uh, that was, of course, a greater than the but that still impacted the security uh, perceptions of the region. So just to put in context, both the GCC and the EU were both organizations built out of the fear or the security perception that there would be some type of instability. Now, in the EU, it was domestic instability, or it was war between the various European countries. And with the GCC, that fear was predicated outward towards uh, various actors that would attempt to undermine or subvert uh, the stability in the region. Now, relations uh, in terms of uh, economic and trade relations between the EU and the GCC, they became, uh, they were started quite early on uh, in the creation of the GCC. Uh, and as a matter of fact, in 1983, you have the first official delegation from the European Union, which visited uh, the Gulf region in order to speak about uh, various uh, avenues for collaboration, trade collaboration, economic collaboration, and so on and so forth. And nearly every year thereafter, you had increasing connections and trade de delegations and so on going uh, to and fro, uh, from the Gulf and from the here and so on. So there was extreme interest in beginning to forging connections, very robust connections between these two blocks. And one thing that we have to put in context is that uh, this has never been seen before. There has never been any type of economic or trade relationships between two regional blocks before. Right? Because actually, there really is no cohesive trade block for any organization such as the EU and GCC. Of course, you have NAFTA, but NAFTA focuses on trade primarily. There are other issues that are of concern to the NAFTA countries of Canada, Mexico, and the US, but uh, principally, it's just a trade agreement, and it really doesn't impinge on forming some type of uh, common front in terms of trade negotiations and so on. ASEAN as well uh, in Southeast Asia, but that uh, doesn't come even, that doesn't nearly approach even where NAFTA stands in terms of collaboration. So the collaborative potential of that particular organization is extremely weak. So we have to look at that. We have to look at the fact that this has never been tried before. Okay? So I'm going to start with uh, my focus on energy <coughs> relations between the two regions. Okay, so principally I'm going to focus on natural gas, but I'm also going to speak quite briefly on uh, renewable energy, because that has become an increasing focus between uh, the EU, relationships between the EU and the GCC. Now the main discussion point is going to be the basics, just to give a broad overview of the Gulf gas sector, and I'm going to speak about the basis of the EU diversification drive. So basically to put the drive uh, into sharper detail, why does the EU want to diversify its natural gas? What are the structural drivers behind it, and uh, whether it will be successful uh, in some of its goals. And then I'm also going to look at uh, pottery expansion uh, into the European market, and I'll focus on Eastern and Central Europe as well. And uh, pottery is uh, attempting to leverage its uh, massive capital investments in terms of the liquefied natural gas sector and its ex exports in that way. So there's going to be in the future either some type of um, greater competition between Russia and uh, Qatar, or if they can uh, overcome the various differences, there might be some collaboration. It depends where this is going to go. But I'm quite certain that Russia does not uh, like uh, Qatar uh, uh, trying to uh, become more heavily engaged in its backyard. And then go look at the future challenges for this relationship, this nasty relationship between the two regional blocks. Now, to give you a brief overview of the Gulf gas sector, uh, the Gulf region has quite intimidating reserves, uh, extremely large amounts of natural gas reside in the region. Of course, uh, Qatar has some of the largest reserves uh, in the region. Now, I'm just looking at the GCC. Uh, if you look at, for instance, Iran, Iran is number one in the Middle East. Uh, number one in the world is Russia, but just within the Gulf region, we have uh, Qatar with about uh, nearly 900 trillion cubic feet, which is the world's third largest natural gas reserve. So we have Oh, it's also the world's number one uh, LNG exporter. This was since 2006 when it uh, overtook uh, Indonesia. Saudi Arabia has about uh, 270 uh, trillion cubic feet, the world's fourth largest. So we have UAE with approximately 230 trillion cubic feet. 
is the world's fifth largest, and Kuwait with approximately 60 trillion feet, which is the world's fifth largest uh, natural gas, uh, natural gas reserves. Although, even though the region has about a quarter of the world's natural gas reserves, nearly a quarter, uh, there's only 8% of uh, utilization. And when I say utilization, this fundamentally means uh, production. Production. So the region has not been able to adequately monetize its natural gas reserves. So throughout the region, you see crippling blackouts, uh, sometimes in various regions. So for instance, in the northern, some of the northern areas uh, during the summer, uh, there tend to be uh, electricity blackouts and so on, due to the sharp increase in uh, electricity demand uh, during the very hot summer months. And of course, during 2009, there was a Sharjah brownout blackout. Uh, so you can see that there are some bottlenecks in terms of electricity production, natural gas production, getting it to the sectors that need it. And Saudi Arabia has had uh, issues. Uh, the only country that hasn't had electricity blackouts or any major natural gas bottlenecks has been Pato, uh, when we talk about the GCC. Now, the basis of EU diversification is that, just to put it simplistically, the EU wants to diversify its energy supplies and reduce reliance upon Russia. And this more or less goes back in, uh, to about uh, 2006, and we all remember uh, the conflict uh, between Russia and Ukraine over natural gas pricing and exports and, and so on. So when uh, Russia, or gas problem, of EU people, of course, consider these to be one and the same, mutually inclusive entities, when Russia cut off natural gas to Ukraine, that seems a wake-up signal uh, to the European Union. And then we start to see the European Union quite slowly at first but after several years, quite rapidly, attempt to explore future opportunities for natural gas imports from other areas of the world. And I suppose that's one thing that the Russians and I consider, is that it does take a long time to turn a battleship. Okay, well, once a battleship turns, then it turns for good. So the Russians thought that uh, they became quite, uh, uh, quite, uh, uh, how can I say, uh, they were very uh, easy. Uh, they didn't attempt to see the actions or the responses and reactions to their plans to increase natural gas prices precipitously in the region. So the basic policy of the EU, their energy policy is driven by energy concern, or I'm sorry, energy security, and also climate change concerns as well. So these are the two main structural drivers. So the energy security is uh, pushing the European Union to forge uh, greater uh, relationships uh, with natural gas suppliers uh, within either the Mediterranean, if you look at Algeria, or the Gulf region, and there have also been uh, nascent uh, uh, plans with uh, Iran, as well this happened several years ago, although with increased focus on sanctions against Iran, some of these plans have petered out. But still, the European Union is on uh, an ever-present quest to secure reliable natural gas. Now, climate change, the way that this impacts the European Union, the European Union's energy profile is that when the European Union seeks to lower its carbon emissions, and its reliance upon uh, oil, uh, in uh, oil in terms of, uh, doesn't really use oil as much in power production, but just oil overall in its energy profile, as well as uh, coal and so on in certain member states. Uh, it will rely much more upon natural gas to fulfill that need. So if you look at the profile uh, for demand in the EU, we start to see a steady increase decade by decade in terms of uh, the demand in the European Union for natural gas. So the central question you must keep in mind as we go through following slides is, where is the EU going to get this increased natural gas? Uh, it's, it's increased natural gas demand. From where is this natural gas going to come? That's a very important question, particularly in the context that the major supplier where there's already a dedicated pipeline network, the European Union does not want to increase its dependence upon that particular player. Okay, so that's a major question. So that's where the Gulf comes in. And uh, there are extremely important developments in terms of uh, the growing availability of liquefied natural gas to meet that need because it increases the fungibility, or to put it simplistically, the transportability of uh, natural gas. So basically it makes uh, liquefied natural gas, if you liquefy it, uh, basically freeze it, uh, then you can transport it anywhere in the world, and it more or less takes on the focus or takes on the characteristics of oil in the sense that it can go anywhere in the world, and it's not held within one location or it's not only restricted to pipeline export. I can just put on a ship and it can go to East Asia, it can go to the United States, it can go to Europe, or what have you. So the massive gas reserves in the Gulf, as well as uh, the diversification strategies of the EU, lead to uh, a natural fit, a very natural fit between these two regions. So there's room for growth, room for growth and collaboration in, in many different fields. And also, uh, this 
is my personal view is that uh, the energy relationship or the energy profile between the European Union and the Gulf is actually going to lead to other types of uh, collaborative enterprises in the future. Now, in the sense of improving EU GCC ties, uh, these uh, relationships uh, or relations between the European Union and the Arabian Gulf has been, have been increasing. The first region to region free trade agreement. Uh, or the negotiations, negotiations board have been uh, formed uh, several years ago. And uh, this will have a profound impact on bilateral uh, negotiations and relations between uh, the European Union and the GCC. Although there have been several uh, problems uh, so far uh, from both sides, from both parties, in terms of what the ultimate form of this agreement is going to be. But still, this is the first ever. I mean, there's never been before uh, in the history of trade negotiations two uh, uh, free trade agreements two economic uh, units, or between two economic blocks. Uh, the EU also, uh, several years ago, initiated formal dialogue with OPEC uh, to find common ground on issues of energy security. And of course, this happened uh, years ago, uh, about 2005, 2006, when we saw the steady increase in the price of oil. And uh, many uh, actors were concerned about that, the United States, Europe, and so on. So energy security took on a very important focus during that time, and I'm certain that's going to take on an extremely important focus now, uh, particularly seeing that there is uh, a sense of instability in the oil market due to the political unease, uh, to put it, uh, let's say, simplistic or nicely uh, within uh, the mean region. So this is going to take a greater focus in the future as well. So the potential for the Gulf to participate in European universification is quite significant, but there are still several factors that give European Union officials pause. Uh, when they look at the region as a vital partner for its diversification plans. Uh, one of the major ones is simply security. Security takes on, uh, uh, it's extremely relevant for EU policymakers, and it's also uh, perceived security and actual security. So it's, it's perceived political uh, instability and also actual political instability. So this plays a role. Uh, there are issues obviously with Iraq, although that is dying down a bit, it's not uh, as significant was several years ago. Uh, and also, of course, the Iranian nuclear issue uh, that uh, takes on a persistent, uh, or that, that's actually a persistent problem for European, uh, European officials, European Union officials. There are issues uh, related to the perception, if the reality is not there, the perception of transnational terrorism, although that has died down. Uh, there's also the issue of piracy uh, within, uh, within the Red Sea region around the Horn of Africa, and that's still consistent. There are, obviously, as I mentioned before, the issue of the Arab revolutions. But I think people are still trying to get a handle on exactly what's going on. This has caught a lot of people off guard. So they still don't quite know how to approach the issue of the Arab Spring or the Jasmine revolutions or, or what have you. On one hand, there's the issue of more democracy, democratization in the region. On the other hand, it's that, OK, if you have masses of individuals protesting in the streets and so on, this is going to upset your plan for energy security. Okay? So I think there's some conflicting aims in terms of European policy, uh, you know, policy uh, makers and, and what have you in the sense of uh, how to view this in terms of their personal or their, their, their national interests and also in terms of the off-stated view towards democratization uh, in the region and elsewhere. There's also growing Gulf energy demand. And I think that this is an issue that a lot of people don't look at. Is that uh, natural gas demand in the Gulf has been growing immensely uh, the Gulf region is attempting to uh, industrialize and modernize uh, its economy. So because of that, it's diversifying in different sectors. So we find a lot of diversification in uh, petrochemicals, uh, fertilizer, energy intensive industries. These are more or less industries that utilize a lot of um, electricity uh, in order to uh, make its products. So if we look at aluminum smelting, or if we look at uh, steel smelting, or what have you, this utilizes a lot of electricity. So you need to have a lot of natural gas, you need to have relatively inexpensive natural gas to fuel this. So the very result that the Gulf countries are attempting to transition away from being primary product exporters, and primary product exporter means that when you just ship the raw commodity, there's no refining, there's no value-added uh, manufacturing going on. You just ship raw oil, and then uh, it's refined in Europe or the United States or, or what have you. So they want to move away from this model because they think that this model is no longer viable. The idea, the notion, is that 
there should be manufacturing, there should be industrialization around the areas where there's natural resources. Okay, so they view that shipping uh, oil or natural gas uh, to, let's say, Europe or to America or what have you, then the production or producing a certain manufactured products from these raw materials and then shipping it back to the region at elevated prices is uh, not a viable strategy. So this also drives some of the understanding of Gulf policymakers in the sense of diverse, their own economic diversification. So industrialization in the Gulf is rapidly increasing the Gulf's own domestic gas demand. So uh, how to put this simplicity is that maybe in 15, 20 years, uh, the Gulf is going to be utilizing most of its own natural gas for its own industrialization. So Europe might not be able to get it, uh, or the United States might not be able to get it, or China, or Japan, or what have you. So that's one thing that uh, gives European uh, Union officials pause as well. And then uh, there's uh, last but not least, obviously, there's the increased Russian interest in forming energy linkages uh, with uh, some of the major natural gas producers in the region. When I talk about gas, or when I talk about energy linkages, these more or less form uh, or comprise uh, the idea of a gas OPEC, which has been bandied about in the press for a long time. And I think most of you know this, but a gas OPEC more or less is a type of cartel which would be based uh, along the lines of OPEC in terms of uh, the export of natural gas and so on, so that there'd be a group of natural gas uh, uh, producers, they collaborate, they set production quotas, and then they try to influence the international price of natural gas or LNG. Okay, so Russia is very aware, very concerned, focused on the fact that there's going to be increased competition from the Gulf region and also from the greater Middle East, and also that the European Union is attempting to diversify. So this really is concentrating the minds of the Russian authorities. So the way that they're attempting to handle this is that they are going, gas Gazprom officials, uh, you know, more or less the national, uh, the national gas company, it's going to officials in Qatar, it's going to uh, meet with Algerian officials, uh, Iranian officials, and what have you, to find out how there could be some type of collaboration on a very deep level in order to influence the price of uh, natural gas in order to act as an obstacle for the European Union to diversify and reach out to the, uh, to the region. So this is something that I think that has to be considered, and the European Union officials as well are, are looking at this. And Qatar's own role in that is a bit like good cop, bad cop. I'm most of you are aware of this analogy, but good cop, bad cop is that uh, what it does is Russia is the bad boy, Russia is the bad cop, and uh, you know, Russia, there's rhetoric, of course, about uh, resource nationalism with the type of Soviet tinge, and you know, it doesn't take too much to uh, you know, get some of these officials who were serving in the Soviet Union to paint the Soviet, you know, to, to look at Russia as being just a rebirth of the Soviet Union, and I mean, that, that's not too far, you know, away from their current perspective. And uh, in addition, you have the, you have the notion that uh, within uh, so within Russia, you have a President Putin, which uh, over the past few years and uh, before uh, that global economic crisis, he was really placing quite uh, difficult or prohibitive uh, restrictions on energy companies that were operating within Russia. Okay, and also there were uh, there were gas uh, cutoffs, natural gas cutoffs, and there were oil you know oil cutoffs to certain countries that uh, attempted to uh, to tow the Russian line. As they say, this this was a major issue. So, uh, so uh, in terms of uh, in terms of Putter playing that role, Putter goes to the European Union officials, and Putter says that look, we have free market. Uh, you know, we're based on free market principles. There's never going to be any issue that we're going to cut off natural gas due to uh, political issues. Okay, we're not going to cut it off, and uh, you know we're friendly. You, know, you can deal with us. You know, you're, you're not going to see KGB agents or S or anything like that. Or, Nowadays, so you can deal with us. We can talk. Okay, so that's how Putter deals with uh, the European Union officials, and then you can see this a type of uh, uh, how can I say this type of uh, role uh, expanded in other areas as well. So, for instance, their relations with Hamas, their relationships, uh, certain relationships with Israel, with Israel, and also you see this with uh, relationships with Hezbollah, Iran, and also hosting uh, CENTCOM. See central command. I mean, so you see the strategy being played out in other areas as well. So the basic strategy of Putter is good cop, bad cop. Talk to all sides. Be more or less the Switzerland or the Vienna, I guess you can say, or the Sweden of the Gulf region. So we're not going to be blocked in terms of branching out. So we're going to have diversification of alliances, more or less. I mean, so simplistically, that's the view of the Putter officials. But despite all these uh, differences between the two regions, uh, there are still two common energy goals. Uh, both are several common energy 
folks. And both regions are committed to enhancing the security and environmental sustainability of hydrocarbons. And the EU is particularly interested in supply diversity as well. Well, the GU, uh, well, the GCC, excuse me, particularly Qatar, is extremely interested in export diversity. So that's a natural fit. I mean, so despite all the differences that I laid out earlier, it's only natural that the two regions are going to come ever closer and closer together. Now, one thing I'd just like to speak about briefly, uh, which is uh, something fairly new, it's, uh, it's that uh, the increased collaboration in terms of renewable energy development and networking between the two and the two regions. So in 2010, I believe it was June or July, the GCC launched a major uh, initiative, a major project in order to, or the GCC and the EU launched a major project to secure the network and supply of clean energy uh, between the two regions by uh, 2012. Uh, and this is termed the GCC EU Clean Energy Network, or SIN uh, for short. And uh, more or less, this more or less will create a permanent network of uh, institutions from the GCC and the EU to develop clean energy cooperation. And, and also, I'd just like to interject. If anyone has any questions about any terminology I'm using or so on, feel free to interrupt me. That's, that's no problem as well. Uh, and uh, also the GCC EU Clean Energy Network will in include joint cooperation, capacity building events, uh, joint research activities, strengthening relationships between the research institutions, utilities, and so on and so forth uh, within the two regions. So the focus of this new uh, initiative is going to be the, uh, trying to buttress uh, the growth and production and so on of renewable energy sources. They're going to look at energy demand uh, between the two regions, uh, energy efficiency, uh, trying to uh, basically how to process or reprocess natural gas, uh, so basically to remove pollutants from natural gas, market integration, and also uh, carbon capture and storage. So basically to remove any carbon uh, from uh, industrial production and how to put this uh, deep within the ground, how to store it underneath the ground. So this is just a brief overview of uh, this uh, NASA collaboration in terms of renewable energy uh, between the two regions. Now I'd like to really get into, uh, I'd like to go into depth, uh, Potter's uh, Europe strategy. Now Potter is the main country that has taken advantage of the EU's diversification drive. Uh, the UAE and Oman, other LNG exporters, don't nearly have as much uh, uh, available natural gas to export. As a matter of fact, as soon as their contracts run out, we're going to see more in terms of the UAE and Oman, we're going to see most of this gas redirected for domestic uh, domestic demand. We're not going to see increased exports coming out of uh, the UAE or Oman unless something radically changes or some major intervention, perhaps. Now, to give the background of country expansion, uh, Qatar built up its LNG infrastructure in the late 1990s and uh, early 2000s. And it did this based on the expectation of extremely strong American uh, natural gas demand. Uh, but uh, obviously, you know what happened a few years ago, the US natural gas prices slumped, and there was also rising domestic production from shale gas, so about 2005. Uh, so uh, this is termed popularly in the press as a shale gas revolution. So uh, I, I think it's a bit premature, but even some people in the US are talking about the US becoming an LNG exporting country, although I think this is premature as there are many issues with shale gas uh, production in the U.S., including this uh, phenomenon of NIMBY, not in my backyard, uh, because people are afraid of uh, pollution in terms of underground uh, water supplies and what have you. And there's been a moratorium in New York on, 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 on shale gas production. So this is, I think, going to act as a block and drop scope for you know, really robust uh, shale gas demand. So I think that some of the earlier ideas have been a bit um, too optimistic, in my view. But still, uh, the U.S demand from uh, the U.S. LNG demand, and projected LNG demand, has dropped precipitously. So it's no longer, uh, Qatar cannot base its, uh, its future LNG export to growth on U.S. demand. And then also the 2008 financial crisis. So this was basically a double impact. You have one, increased American uh, shale gas, shale gas uh, production, and then you have reduced uh, usage or reduced demand at the same time. So these were uh, two events that uh, really changed the coordinates, that really changed uh, the pilot or the strategy of, uh, or the end result of what Pudger was hoping for in terms of uh, shipping most of this LNG to the United States. Uh, and we can see how weak this U.S. demand was by uh, some of the pricing. Uh, the, the, the Henry Hoff pricing, which acts as a benchmark for natural gas pricing in the U.S., 
This dropped by about a quarter in 2008, and uh, again in a further 7% in 2009. Uh, so this really influenced Putter to uh, search for other markets, uh, and most notably these markets were in Eastern Europe and also the Asian Pacific market. Uh, and uh, as I indicated earlier, these changes in U.S. demand for LNG imports, it may be structural. Structural. I, I, I don't think it's necessarily temporal. I, I think that these changes are going to uh, be prevalent for uh, a long time. I mean, even though there are concerns with shale gas production, I think that this increased production will uh, mitigate uh, the U.S. increasing its natural gas imports from other areas in the world. This is a major, major issue in terms of the puckery perspective on the export, LNG export. Now, if we look at what putter is, uh, how putter is attempting to penetrate uh, the Eastern European market, uh, in, uh, I believe this was in 2010, Putter Gas agreed to export about uh, 1.5 billion cubic meters per year, which is about one tenth of Poland's uh, annual consumption. And this is supposed to start from about 2014 until 2034. The deal is worth about 550 million US, and it's the first gas agreement signed by Poland in the last 17 years. So you can see how Eastern, Eastern Europe is really attempting to move away from Russia which has more than enough natural gas in reaching and going forward towards uh, the Gulf market. Greece as well. In 2010, uh, Putter and Greece signed a, a memorandum of understanding, which was a preliminary step for Putter to invest $6.6 billion US dollars in uh, Greece's energy sector, and also it included the construction of a, a liquefied natural gas terminal in order to uh, make it much easier for entry of Putter and gas to sell. Southeastern Europe. So the way Qatar has uh, attempted to increase its uh, exports into the region is that much of the region uh, within Eastern Europe and uh, Southeastern Europe as well, they don't have the infrastructure uh, to import LNG. And of course, during uh, this financial crisis, uh, it's very difficult to even uh, assume uh, where they could get these funds from. So what Qatar is doing is it's acting as a type of um, uh, banker or financier, I guess you can say, is that it it, it gives them low interest loans in order to build the necessary facilities to import country gas. So that's what we're seeing in the region. We're seeing that uh, country authorities are giving the money for the necessary infrastructure to be built. And then this infrastructure, of course, is going to come from no one else because there are no other countries that are able to export the financial gas at the same scope that uh, countries are able to do that. So uh, that's something that is very important uh, to look at. And uh, according to the terms of this uh, memorandum of understanding, uh, the gasification terminal uh, that's going to be built is worth about $4.5 billion. And uh, not to get too much into uh, the details, uh, but uh, it has a capacity of about 7 billion cubic meters. And uh, this will be built in Western Greece by Pudger Petroleum. And, uh, and so on. This is going to be located in town of Escatos. And uh, there are also provisions uh, that, uh, that will allow liquefied petroleum gas to be stored as well. and then. This particular deal will produce electricity for domestic consumption, but there's also the view that the country authorities have for potential export uh, to the Italian market. So the, country, uh, co the countries are looking to expand uh, quite uh, significantly uh, within Europe. Now, the deals uh, represent, the Greece deal represents about, or, or, or envisions that there would be 70% of electricity uh, produced within Greece and then be exported to Italy. So if we look at, uh, if we have a largest or a broader focus of uh, Putter's Greek, uh, Greek investment, uh, then we can see that this is principally aimed at the Italian market. Uh, because, of course, Greece is going to import country LNG, electricity will be, be produced there, and then it will be shipped to, or it will be exported, or what have you, to the Italian market. And also, Italy is going to have uh, quite significant uh, natural gas needs uh, in uh, the coming years. By 2020, uh, Putter, or Italy, excuse me, will have to import about 90 billion cubic meters. And uh, so this deal, if you look at uh, the, the Greece deal, will allow Hunter to basically kill two birds with one stone, uh, to use uh, you know, an analogy, and uh, to sell to both markets simultaneously. Now, uh, Bulgaria. Hunter uh, is attempting to uh, uh, really get involved in the Bulgarian market as well. In 2009, there's an MOU signed for potential country financing for the Bulgarian LNG terminal on that. Asian coast, and this is basically will be a gateway for country imports for other Eastern European countries.
countries. So if we look at the southeastern uh, penetration, country penetration, that's basically to, to, be, to get this side of the European market. So basically to get the neighboring countries, or to get Greece's, uh, to get the, uh, Greece's neighbors. Now if we look at uh, Bulgaria, what Putra is attempting to do is uh, to use Bulgaria as a gateway uh, for Putri influence and Putri LNG exports uh, for other Eastern European countries. Uh, the MOU that was signed, uh, I'm sorry, this was, as a title, it's not Egyptian, it's Putri, but uh, this would be uh, 1 billion cubic meters per year, and uh, potentially this will start in 2012. And uh, also uh, at the SOFIA summit in 2009, uh, Bulgaria and Greece, remember these are the two entities that uh, were uh, negotiating with Putra for LNG imports, also agreed to link their respective gas grids as well. So Putra is really leveraging off uh, closer energy connections between Eastern European countries. Now Britain, uh, this was actually quite recent in February uh, 23rd, uh, 2011. So just a few weeks ago, uh, Centrica, which is a parent company of British Gas, announced that uh, there was a, a three-year contract uh, with uh, Putra Gas to deliver 2.4 million tons per year of LNG to Britain. Now, this is significant because it's about 10% of the UK's annual residential demand. This is enough to meet uh, the need of about 2.5 million households. And this relationship is only expected to grow. Uh, if we look at 2010, Putra supplied the UK with about 15% of total uh, gas demand by 2025, it's expected to meet about nearly half of that. So we can see that uh, Britain is going to have uh, quite an interest uh, in Putra's future. And uh, I spoke with individuals actually just a few days ago, and they thought that this would perhaps migrate to some security interests as well. We could see uh, we could see Putra uh, being more dependent on Britain and other European countries for security needs as these countries increase their natural gas dependence. But that remains uh, in the up in the air. Uh, for certain to say that that will happen. But to just give a brief analysis, uh, Putter has attempted to maximize its exports to Europe, and what it has done, and the backbone to the strategy has been equity stakes in the gasification terminals in many of the countries, and in particular we look at Italy and Britain, and all of these LNG details, uh, or deals, uh, fit into the role of Putter attempting to promote itself as a reliable supplier to Europe. So while the EU and Russia appear to be talking to each other, or talking at each other, instead of to each other, uh, the clear beneficiary uh, of this policy is going to be Potter, who is attempting to position itself as a Saudi Arabia of LNG for the foreseeable future. Now, uh, some of the challenges towards the future of Potter EU, uh, EU exports. Uh, the global financial crisis has uh, really disrupted the market, the energy market. Uh, there's been a depressed uh, price environment, and uh, this has pushed Potter and some of the other major suppliers, most notably in Russia, uh, to consult our production policies, or at least this is a bit speculative, but definitely uh, gas pump officials have gone to Qatar, they've gone to Algeria and so on, and as a matter of fact, there was a meeting last year uh, where gas pump officials went to Doha to meet with the uh, QP officials, and interestingly enough, right after the meeting, uh, Qatar announced that there was going to be 66% uh, shut in, or basically it means that a drop in production in its LNG uh, facilities, at the same time that Russia announced that there's going to be in uh, production as well. Now, of course, it's just speculative. You know, you, you don't exactly know what's going on behind closed doors, but I think nonetheless that was interesting. And uh, after during this time, it also shut down six out of twelve of its production units uh, during the summer. Now, uh, there's going to be increased, and this is one of the major challenges: increased regional gas demand emanating from the Gulf. And I think that uh, unless the European Union really considers uh, how the Gulf is going to start to utilize much more of its natural gas production at home. It's not going to be, uh, it's not going to be exporting it, but producing it, and it's going to be consuming it at home. Then I think that uh, Europe will really have to develop a much more robust strategy because uh, this is something that uh, the Gulf countries are really moving forward with in terms of utilizing their own natural gas and their own uh, increasing their own manufacturing. And there's also increasing competition for LNG uh, supplies emanating from the Asian market. Now, of course, we all know China. Now, the recent uh, disaster at uh, Fukushima uh, in Japan, that we, of course, we've all heard about uh, the tragedy. Now, how this is going to play out, no one knows for certain, but obviously, there's going to be a reassessment of Japan's nuclear needs and uh, how much Japan is an island nation, which has been obsessed 
really obsessed about secu uh, energy security because right? Japan does not want to depend upon uh, uh, imports of, of oil and natural gas. Uh, because uh, if we go back even to World War II, the first oil embargo in the world was not by OPEC, not by uh, Saudi Arabia or what have you. The first oil embargo was actually by the United States. And the United States implemented an oil embargo against Japan during the war. So in place in that context, we can see that the Japanese authorities are very cognizant of the fact that any type of disruption or what have you will impact their ability to viably uh, keep their uh, economic engine uh, going. So uh, this is a very, very important issue. So Fukushima may end up being that Japanese uh, demand is going to increase precipitously, and that will also draw away some of the LNG which could have been destined for the European market. So thank you for your attention, and uh, please feel free to let me know whatever questions you have. Okay, well, we'll open the floor up to discussion, but I, I want to start off by asking the, uh, the first question, Justin. Um, several times you mentioned the, the increased demand that uh, the Gulf will have for more gas supplies because of industrialization and whatnot. Um, but you also mentioned the fact that we already have bottlenecks in terms of electric supply in some of the Emirates and other GCC countries. Um, how do we how do we alleviate those bottlenecks? Okay, well that's a very good question, Steve. Um, well, in terms of the bottlenecks, there are bottlenecks uh, in the electricity sector, uh, there are bottlenecks of course in the natural gas sector. Uh, so the bottlenecks are not merely located in the production of natural gas. It's also located if you look at where this natural gas is going, where it's being produced or where it's being consumed and so on. So uh, the Gulf countries, first of all, if you look at the UAE, uh, there isn't a comprehensive Emirati energy policy. And that's a major obstacle. That's a major obstacle because each Emirat has its own energy policy and uh, it has uh, mitigated or forestalled any type of development of a comprehensive energy policy, which I think would go an extremely long way towards eliminating some of these bottlenecks. So some of these bottlenecks are just look, are just um, related to the, the fact that there are different policies within different Emirates and, and what have you. That's a major issue. Um, but I think the most important issue that developed countries have to deal with is merely having the natural gas. I think that the bottlenecks are a bit secondary. The bottlenecks are a bit sec secondary because you have to, first of all, monetize natural gas uh, uh, reserves. That means monetize, you have to produce it. And then if you have enough natural gas there, then I think you can go on and start to attempt to resolve these bottlenecks. But the bottlenecks are quite secondary. In order to resolve uh, or to monetize uh, natural gas, natural gas reserves within the Gulf, there needs to be a comprehensive reassessment of the regional gas pricing framework. So uh, where it stands now, the, the, the gas pricing framework in the Gulf is much too inexpensive. Uh, it's only about uh, roughly from a dollar to at the higher end of the spectrum, maybe about $1.70 to $2 per MMBTU, which is a million uh, British uh, mineral units, which is the unit of measurement. Uh, now, if you compare that with how much natural gas uh, was uh, in the United States to see before the, the global economic crisis, let's uh, say 2008 as a benchmark, that was about uh, anywhere from like 11 to $13 or mm -hmm. so on. So I, there's a great disparity within that, okay? Although another thing we have to consider is that there is no international natural gas price. So because of that, their pricing framework is quite uh, uh, segmented. So within the Gulf region, uh, this policy was viable to have extremely inexpensive natural gas because this, this will help to fuel their production, uh, excuse me for the pun. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, as the natural gas started to, uh, as natural gas demand started to increase precipitously, uh, particularly from 2002 into 2008, uh, you find that uh, this pricing strategy was no longer viable because the Gulf countries, they migrated or they transitioned from their demand on associate natural gas, which is produced from oil, uh, from uh, oil reserves, and then once you have the capital infrastructure in place to produce additional or each incremental unit of gas is, is like basically zero, zero cents, and there's, there's no cost uh, implied. And then, because they were utilizing most of the gas coming from those sources, when they were attempting to transition to uh, unassociated gas reserves, and unassociated gas reserves are standalone gas goods, more or less. So that means that you actually have to invest uh, significant capital in order to uh, uh, produce this gas, and also a lot of this gas tends to be quite, uh, it, it has pollutants, so it, some of the gas tends to be quite complex to produce. So the production cost is a bit higher 
Okay, so you go from basically zero, because you have the existing capital infrastructure in place with the associate gas, to about $5 per MMBTU for new fields that are coming online. You can see the discrepancy and why this strategy is no longer viable and why, which is the root cause of the natural gas crisis in the Gulf, uh, international oil companies don't want to be involved because the gas is going to be dedicated for domestic demand and it's going to be at domestic pricing. And if you compare that to Japanese, we're historically paying about $20 per MBTU versus domestically, let's say, at the highest at the highest end of the spectrum, about $1.75 per MBTU. Uh, why would Shell or kind of Phillips want to even get involved in producing gas for domestic consumption here? It doesn't make sense for them. That's why we haven't really seen the international oil companies becoming involved, unless that gas is being sold uh, externally or for uh, external market. So I think that's a major issue. But there has been move, movement in terms of uh, re re uh, resolving these bottlenecks. In terms of electricity, building new, uh, uh, modernizing electrical grids. There's been the GCCIP, the Gulf Cooperation Council Interconnection Project, which is really a substantive step for Gulf uh, integration uh, in terms of uh, power and also for future collaboration. So now the Gulf countries are shipping electricity across the border uh, with no problem. So as a result of that, they had to modernize their electrical grids. Uh, there was a certain time period that, um, that the grids had to be, the national grids had to be modernized, and they had certain criteria. Any questions for me? Robin. Yes, uh, Robin Mills, uh, Emirates National Oil Company. Uh, yeah, Robin Mills, Emirates National Oil Company. Uh, just wondering, Justin, I mean, of course, the theme of the talk was uh, GCC EU energy cooperation. And, and of course, you stressed the very important role of Qatar in exporting gas to, to the, the EU, you know, uh, quite rightly. Um, but I wonder if, you know, based on the discussion we just had, are we actually talking about a competition between the EU and every other GCC member other than Qatar for Qatar's gas? Okay. Yes, well, that's a very interesting question. I think that, um, first and foremost, uh, you're right, that there has been a type of uh, collapse of uh, intra-Gulf cooperation in terms of natural gas uh, export, uh, particularly after dolphins. So there is no uh, fraternal pricing, or there's no brotherly pricing available in terms of the Gulf. That used to be the case, OK? So uh, the Almanis perhaps could call uh, Doha and say, OK, we'd like to have additional gas, and so on. and. Uh, QP would perhaps comply, you know, you have the Dolphin project and then uh, that's it. And uh, countries would take a significant price cut, okay, uh, as to what they could have gotten uh, from all the markets. Uh, but now the countries are no longer doing that. So what we see, we don't see an expansion of the Dolphin project. What we see is LNG export to Dubai. And we see, uh, we see Kuwait purchasing LNG as far away, as far afield from Russia. But uh, I think that we need to look at this a bit more in depth. Uh, on one hand, all these countries have their own domestic gas reserves, okay? So if you look at the UAE, they have enough gas to fuel their industrialization. Uh, frankly, they don't need to depend upon dolphin gas. They need to depend upon it only to the extent that they can't produce their own gas. But the gas is sitting underneath, you know, metaphorically underneath us, okay? The gas is here, okay? It's not uh, like Europe where they need to get gas from elsewhere. They have the gas. It's merely uh, the, the need to uh, monetize and produce that gas. And I already see the other Gulf countries uh, going in that direction. We can see major gas development projects here in the UAE, for example, the Shot Gas Field. Uh, that's a major project. There are also other projects as well to attempt to increase uh, the gas production. Uh, there, are, of course, are projects in Saudi Arabia right now. And in addition to the projects in Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia is not going to import gas in the near future. So Saudi Arabia is not even a policy. Uh, and uh, for the other countries, uh, Kuwait, uh, well, the Kuwaitis will perhaps be a uh, LNG for the foreseeable future, uh, but uh, they think that there should still be some type of fraternity, fraternal pricing available uh, from uh, Qatar. Uh, so, to make a long story short, I don't really agree that there's going to be cooperation for Qatar gas emanating from the GCC versus Europe. I don't really see that happening. What I see instead is that the Gulf countries are going to continue with their own national gas development plans, be that as it may. Okay, or otherwise they would just pay the price which countries want for certain amounts to hold them over during the summer months or what have you. And these summer months are quite 
this uh, the summer loss here because it's quite important because that's when European demand goes down as well. So uh, I think that uh, this policy of uh, European uh, competition, as you stated, or potential future of European competition with golf, won't really come to fruition. There will be competition, however, between, uh, let's say, the Asian market and the European Union. Okay, this is definitely will come, but with, within the GCC, I don't see them struggling for a pottery guess. Yeah, thank you. So it's more, I mean, I absolutely agree on the fraternal point. I think anybody who expects their neighbors to give them a couple of special day to do this is fooling themselves. Um, but but I, you know, I also think, I guess, Qatar had not built up its LNG business in the way that it did. It, 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 its only option would have been to export to its neighbors at pretty low prices and would have had more dolphins. And you know, the reason we didn't is because LNG, you know, global prices went up and LNG technology advanced and LNG became a viable uh, export method. Um, but I, I guess that leads you to think that gas is, you know, if the individual GCC countries aren't successful in developing their own reserves, you know, by, by raising domestic prices somewhat, then I guess gas uh, isn't the driver for kind of GC, within uh, GCC integration that you might have thought it would be a few years ago. Yes. Yes, yes, absolutely. That was a very good point. I mean, I mean, I do think that uh, there is cooperation, but that cooperation is taking place through the GCCIP. Okay, so if we look at the GCCIP, the Gulf Cooperation Council uh, Integration Project, okay, which is basically a pan golf gas, uh, pan golf electricity grid, okay, would you really need to import natural gas if you have that? Okay, so if there's already a pan golf electricity uh, electrical grid in place, okay, and right now I mean, there have already been instances of successful uh, transboundary or transcountry or uh, uh, electricity export. Uh, would you still thereby need to import natural gas? Would there still need to be dolphins? Would there still need to be LNG import if you already have a dedicated electrical infrastructure in place? No, I don't think that would be necessary. You just import the electricity. Uh, so I think that on that front, there's been a lot of collaboration. So I think that this is also another point why uh, potential increases in, in the LNG export from Qatar to other GCC countries is not necessary. And there hasn't been the resistance from certain actors, most notably Saudi Arabia, uh, in terms of, uh, as we all saw, Saudi Arabia really rejected the Dolphin, Dolphin Natural Gas Project, and uh, Saudi Arabia thought that it was, um, that uh, Qatar was a bit of an upstart, perhaps, attempting to uh, undermine its uh, influence, or I guess as some Gulf countries saying the hegemony of Saudi Arabia within the region. But nonetheless, uh, there has been no resistance uh, with the GCCIP. This is the very model of golf cooperation. So I, I, I don't see actually an increase in, in LNG or natural gas imports from Qatar. I think that you already have the basic infrastructure in place. You have increased natural, uh, natural gas production from the Gulf countries themselves. I think that we're starting to see incremental movements towards uh, the reformation of the domestic pricing, natural gas pricing within each country. It's slow. It's very slow, and it's, 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 it's quite incremental, but it's happening. And then we see the GCCIP. So you can just import the electricity you need. You don't need to import natural gas and produce electricity from that. Other questions? I will um, I'll take the opportunity to ask another one. Then. Um, we've talked about the uh, GCC demand for top three gas and EU demand. Um, actually, two two sort of unrelated questions. Um, how do how do the far how does the Far East figure into the picture, um, particularly China and India? They're throwing demands. And the second question is, as I said, completely unrelated. Um, when you when you opened the presentation, you characterized GCC EU relations as basically two blocks. Um, but from my perception and my observation within the presentation, it basically, the, the relationships that you describe pretty much involve bilateral deals between Qatar and specific EU countries. So I'm wondering whether there are other levels of the relationship that involve the GCC as a block as opposed to just Qatar and the EU as opposed to individual countries. Okay. 
In terms of uh, your first question, uh, how the Far East, uh, what role that plays, um, okay, well to talk about, to, to, to get with the most, or to speak about the most uh, contemporary events, uh, we look at uh, Fukushima, uh, the tragedy in Japan, uh, definitely Japanese natural demand, uh, or natural gas demand is going to increase, it's going to increase significantly as uh, it can be assessed its uh, dependence on nuclear energy and also uh, the Fukushima plant that goes offline because that plant is never going to be uh, coming back online. Uh, we can be certain of that. Uh, so we're going to start to see increased uh, increased uh, natural gas demand emanating from Japan. As a matter of fact, uh, just a few days ago, Qatar and uh, Russia announced that they would send emergency LNG supplies to Japan in order to help meet this shortfall. So that's a major issue. So now Japan, I foresee that there's going to be uh, a sure shift or transition to uh, to reducing its nuclear nuclear demand, nuclear uh, energy production, and moving towards uh, natural gas uh, imports in order to meet their shortfall uh, from its uh, power generation uh, uh, supplies. And, and then there's also the aspect of China. Uh, within China, China growth has been phenomenal, as we all know. I mean, we have, uh, what, about 9% uh, growth per annum, and I think this has been, well, since the late uh, 1990s or so. And so there has been uh, a great need for natural gas to fuel this uh, economic or this industrial beast, uh, which is known as Chinese low-cost manufacturing, this economic beast. So uh, because of that, uh, the Chinese have been reaching out to the countries, and uh, they have been building many more LNG uh, terminals and regasification terminals and, and what have you in order to be able to import country LNG. So the countries are going to be engaged quite fully within the East Asian market. Uh, another thing as well is that uh, the Japanese are known to pay top dollar uh, in order to uh, secure their, their LNG. So the Japanese will, will beat anyone in terms of uh, the price that they're going to pay for uh, LNG. Now you know what else would beat them? The Japanese are right to pay because they want to be able to have enough gas, natural gas demand on hand. Uh, so uh, we can definitely see that there are cargoes that are being uh, take advantage of arbitrage opportunities that are being redirected to the East Asian market from the European and the U.S. market. And also, if you look at uh, the U.S., the U.S. is a mature market. There's been a fair degree of deindustrialization, I guess you want to call it that. Uh, there's also been uh, the issue, the more acute issue, of the global economic crisis. So that has, of course, lowered U.S. demand. And then there's been an increase in shale gas, uh, shale gas production. So the U.S. is pretty much out of the picture when we look at being uh, a future natural gas importer on a significant scale. European Union as well, uh, there are some, at least in the short term, because of the global economic crisis, this demand has really gone down. So cargoes are now being redirected to the Asian market, to China, where growth is still quite robust. Uh, we see a lesser, we see certain deals being formed with India as well. So Asia is growing. Uh, Asia has not been uh, really hit by this type of um, uh, sense of uh, uh, despondency. That you find within the mature economies, and they still view economic growth as being quite, uh, quite robust. Uh, but when you speak with many people from, uh, let's say, the Western economies, uh, there's a very type of pessimistic view of where things are going to go. So, I mean, this plays more of a psychological aspect, but still, the Eastern market, uh, Asia Pacific, is going to be a very, very important center, which is going to uh, shift, let's say, the, 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 the center of gravity away from, let's say, uh, the Atlantic region, the Atlantic. Basin two uh, to the Pacific Basin. And then for your second question, uh, what are some other, I believe you asked, what are some other uh, aspects or uh, what are some uh, uh, other collaborative initiatives between the EU and the GCC uh, besides this? Because I focused a bit on Qatar because Qatar is a major one, but I believe that uh, this moves beyond Qatar. Uh, there have been, uh, in terms of GCC, EU relationships, uh, there has been the first EU naval uh, unit uh, which has been dispatched to the Horn of Africa in order to guard against piracy. Uh, now this happened about uh, about two years ago. So it's the first pan-European naval force. And, and I think that uh, this has, uh, this, even though it's small, this really does have a significant bearing on how the European Union seeks to integrate its uh, various uh, military sectors, reduces dependence on NATO, European security force, and then taking a larger portion of Gulf security, uh, Gulf security needs, so patrolling as well. And then you can see that even with this Libyan affair, uh, whereas the U.S. In, in I guess notable contrast to some years ago was uh, the one who did.
you to want to go into Libya, and everyone else was <laughs> wanting to run into Libya. So I, what, how, how does this bear on future U.S. involvement uh, in the region? I mean, I think that we're going to see the U.S. is going to be much less willing uh, to uh, be involved militarily uh, within uh, countries in the region, and it's going to want other countries to undertake, undertake uh, more of their security burden. Okay, and the U.S. will act as, as an enabler. Okay, so because of this, I'm going to see what I do see is that future European military uh, preparedness and capacity growth, the Europeans seeking to undertake a greater, uh, or taking some of the burden off the US in terms of security involvement within the Gulf. So that's one military to military agreement. And also the Gulf countries may be diversified in terms of their suppliers, military armament suppliers, and reaching out to the French, reaching out to the British, and so on. So that's one issue. And then uh, there's also been uh, issues with, uh, of course, security security issues, that's been well known. So there have been, uh, of course, concerns about uh, Al-Qaeda and what have you. So this has brought European Union officials going to the Gulf, Gulf officials going there, because they both see, at least until several years ago, I think that uh, Al-Qaeda has kind of diminished uh, the sense of importance for many people. But uh, they have collaborated in terms of uh, security in this, uh, this aspect. And uh, there's been uh, several other, uh, several other fronts. Uh, there's a GCC. Uh, EU free trade agreement, which is currently being negotiated. But I must caution that there have been uh, critical, uh, critical uh, obstacles. Okay, and some of the obstacles have been that due to the prodigious uh, uh, natural gas uh, reserves uh, that are in the Gulf region and the low price that the Gulf countries charge the domestic sector, and they're diversifying as well into petrochemical growth and so on. Uh, the European uh, Union. Members feel that uh, the Gulf countries are dumping uh, some of their uh, petrochemical products within the European Union. So there were some tariffs that were slapped on uh, products from the UAE, plastic products, and, and what have you. And also China and China and India as well. They have also accused uh, the, uh, some of the Gulf countries of dumping uh, petrochemicals. So this is could be a type of obstacle uh, for uh, future growth, and, and there has been a bit of bombastic. Rhetoric that has been launched back and forth uh, between the various sides. So uh, there, there's an industrial group, the GCC Petrochemical uh, Industrial Group, and they have advocated that all the petrochemical, uh, petrochemical uh, producers within the GCC should band together and that they should really make certain that if one country attempts to divide and conquer, then let's say Europe or uh, there's a particular country in Europe, let's say France, and attempts to stop fines on a, on a Gulf uh, producer, petrochemical. So then all the countries could collaborate and thereby uh, put uh, tariffs on, on products emanating from that particular country and perhaps limit the petrochemical uh, product uh, export to that particular country. So acting in blocks, so type of petrochemical old pack, uh, for, for lack of a better uh, uh, analogy. Thank you very much, Justin. Thank you, Steve. Your research and current presentation, yes, it has solved many uh, queries that was running in my mind, but then again, it has raised many questions as well. But uh, yes, it is indeed a provider, a secure provider of natural gas, but there must be something they'll be asking in return. Any favor could be, I don't know if the FIFA is this partial, <laughs> FIFA could be this by, uh, you know, a, blur, a puzzle. Well, again, what, what would be other demanding in return? That's number one. Secondly, you mentioned about the, the, the diversification of uh, GCC itself. GCC, we can see that now they are moving towards CNG power vehicles. Before there was petrol, now it comes in as a compressed natural gas. They're moving, we have seen uh, in Abu Dhabi, there's quite a few development. The infrastructure of gas has been already laid out in Sharjah by Luta Group. And we have seen. Uh, CNG stations in in, uh, in charge itself. Yes, there is, there will be local consumption. Again, uh, the second comment uh, or my last comment I would like to make is: Now you said there will be a political relationship. How European Union or how European countries look upon it, Israel and Arab relationship. If this can be like that, can can we say that it is much uh, softer way of using the same thing that? King Faisal used once 
like the Qatar will having a power, will Europeans or Americans that's supporting Israel big time, will that this happen? Two percent Okay, I'm okay. okay, could you please clarify your, your last comment in, in, in a nutshell, what, what exactly are you asking? In the sense that will the countries attempt to leverage their natural gas as a type of, uh, in order to uh, have the European Union countries become dependent on it and thereby become heavily involved in its security needs? Or to what extent? To the extent they would definitely would not want Qatar to have that amount of power, and they would not definitely want to depend on Qatar. Okay. Well, uh, to your first question, uh, what are the countries asking for? Money. <laughs> yes. As simple as that. I mean, the countries are demanding market price. That's it. Okay. So if you pay market price for Qatar gas, okay, no fraternal discounts. GCC discounts, okay, nothing of that nature. If you pay for it, they would deliver. Simple as that. So that's what the countries are asking for. That's why we saw that um, the, the negotiations between Kuwait and QP, how uh, they broke down. Simply why? Because uh, the Kuwaitis saw that there would be a discount, and the countries said, no, you're going to pay the full market amount. Okay? And uh, so here we, here we have this uh, type of, uh, uh, how can I say this? this? This is very odd scenario whereby Kuwait uh, but it's, uh, it's now uh, receiving its natural gas, it's its LNG from, uh, from Shell, and from Shell's portfolio of natural gas. So some of the uh, Kuwaiti natural gas is coming as far away as the Sethman food in Russia from Australia and what have you, even though it's right there in the neighborhood. Okay, and why is that? That deals with price. Okay, so the countries just want money, and they want the full market price. Okay, so it's not a political issue, they're not politicizing. Uh, natural gas, uh, previously they, uh, they were to a certain extent, they said that uh, we'll use natural gas as a type of uh, glue, cement, uh, between the other GCC countries, uh, and uh, perhaps if they depend upon us, our influence in the region will grow, and as a result we'll give cut rate uh, pricing, but uh, that's no longer the case, so just one. Uh, your second comment is about taking us uh, in the transportation sector, uh, definitely natural gas uh, uh, demand is growing. Although I, I see that this is really going to be minimal, I think. I think that mostly it's going to be due to industrialization. I think electricity demand, the demographic boom that's happening in the region. Uh, we see uh, the relocation of uh, various energy intensive industries to the region as well. Uh, we have uh, petrochemical uh, producers relocating to the Gulf region, uh, cement, uh, what have you, cement producers, uh, aluminum smelters, and so on. And then we have these huge stimulus plans that have been announced uh, in the wake of the financial crisis, okay, which is going to add to this increase in demand. And then uh, I think what's going to happen as well, uh, in terms of uh, if you look at what uh, Medic Abdullah or King Abdullah uh, announced uh, about a week ago, a package of handouts or subsidies uh, and so on. So we're going to see more of these uh, subsidies, which are announced, I think, uh, within the coming weeks in order to resolve uh, some of these uh, tensions uh, that are happening uh, between certain, uh, certain uh, sectors of the, of the populace. So uh, this is going to increase as well, natural gas demand. So I think that's going to be a major a major player uh, in terms of natural gas demand from the region. And uh, three, uh, if I understand correctly, uh, what I conclude is that, and, and you made a very a point about the point, is that uh, will the Western countries European Union want to allow the countries to have that much power over their uh, economic future, more or less, because if they depend upon the countries for a large degree of their natural gas, and let's say as Britain, by 2025, it's estimated that they would have, that half their natural gas is, is going to come from Qatar. So that's that's extremely that's that's a, that's a significant amount of natural gas coming from one source. Okay, so that you're saying basically, regardless of whether they're good cop, bad cop. Whatever, just that degree of of, of, of uh, dependence upon one source. Yeah, I, I I do think so. I mean, I think the countries have been. Um, I think that they've been uh, playing this uh, quite well. Uh, I think that in a sense that they are portraying themselves as open, uh, quite dynamic, liberalizing at its own pace, modernizing. You know, a good place to do business and, and what have you. Uh, they are trying to resolve any types of uh, fears that are. In but I really don't see, uh, points well taken with uh, King Faisal in the sense of uh, launching the oil embargo in 1973 due to the Israeli war. Uh, but uh, I don't really 
really see the countries playing that, uh, playing that card. I mean, there's a more structural transition that's, under, that's being uh, undertaken within the European Union to diversify, yes, and their diversification now would be from either uh, be from Russia transitioning to, uh, to, to Qatar. But at the same time, we have these prevalent uh, uh, notions of uh, reducing the carbon intensity of your economy. I mean, so if this is one of your most important goals, reducing your carbon intensity, your economy is so decarbonization of your economy, okay? So obviously you have to move to more uh, clean or to cleaner sources, i.e. natural gas is one of them. Two, you need to reduce dependence upon the Russian bear, as they say. And then three, you want to kind of uh, move into the Gulf and what have you, because uh, that has been historically a region that you have not received a lot of natural gas from. Okay, I think all these factors together will lead the European countries more or less to depend much more upon Potter, regardless of the fears that are inherent as to how Qatar will use that role. And I think what's going to happen is that the security linkages, security linkages between uh, countries that are heavily dependent upon Qatar gas and Qatar are going to increase. So we're going to see them taking an active interest in the security concerns of Qatar. We can see this with uh, CENTCOM, uh, uh, you know, the U.S. Central Command is located there, even though Qatar is not a major exporter of natural gas to the United States. Uh, we can see, uh, let's say, French being involved in uh, the UAE, which is a step towards uh, security diversification in the region. So I think that this is only going to go, uh, this is going to continue in the future. Fantastic. Justin, I, I would like to go on even more. I, I have a feeling that you, you probably could, but we have to, uh, we have to wrap it up here. Um, I want to thank you for another wonderful presentation. I always learn a lot when I listen to you speak. Very well structured and well presented. And uh, thank you for the good work. Um, I hope we can have you back in a few months whenever your book is published to do a book signing. I think uh, let me try out the, the title of it once again Desert Dreams The Quest for Gulf Integration from the, from the Arab Revolt to the Gulf Cooperation Council.